Alex, would you like to, to come and join me up here? So, welcome, Dr. Alex Kenyon. Thank you very much. Sorry, uh, we're being uh, asked to just move around just okay. very slightly. That's right, we're, we're kind of together on this, so that's, uh, that's all good. So, if Martin is happy at the back, he is. That's we're cool. All good. It's so good when you, when you have to work in concert with these people, I think, because otherwise <laughs> you, you just don't get that, that experience that would, that would be really fulfilling otherwise. So, yeah. thank you, Martin. Um, Alex, I'm going to let you introduce yourself okay. and also tell me a little bit about some of the research that you've been doing. I know you've got a very special offer for uh, some of the, well, for the delegates if they, get to, if they get to you within a certain time frame. Yes. So let's start there and then okay. we will have a chat and we're, we'll pick on the audience. Well, we won't pick on them, but we're <laughs> volunteer, you know, if they've got questions about the future of events, that'll be fabulous. So. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll um, pass to you now. Okay. Thank you very much, Paul. So my name is Dr. Alexandra Kenyon, and I'm from Leeds Metropolitan University. And I've been doing some research with a colleague of mine, Jackie Mulligan, and other people from our team about the future of events. We were commissioned by MPI, and we were actually sponsored by PSAV, Jamara, and Omni Hotels. And I think the big question on everybody's lips really, well what are the big issues that's going to affect our industry in the future? And it's a question that maybe you can tweet your answer and just or click and answer in your mind now, there's something that you think is going to be a big issue in the future, what would it be? So what, what's so, your, uh, yeah, what's, what's, the what's, big your, one? what's your big issue? Yeah. Uh, look at this, they're, they're typing on their uh, pads yeah. already, so that's fantastic. <laughs> So the question, uh, and you guys at home and in your office, what is the big issue that you see coming up? All we want to know is, what is it, a word? Do you just yeah, want a just word? Yeah, just, just one word. Just one word. That's all Alex is after, just one word. What will affect you the most? What would you say? Okay, yeah, so, prices. So pr <laughs> price is coming up. <laughs> yeah, budgets, price. More for less. Okay. Extra value. Good value. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Three words is fine. More for less. That's fine. That's fine. Well, the research that we did, we asked the very same question of everybody. What big issues do you think will happen to you in the future? And we went outside our industry as well as inside our industry because sometimes we're quite focused, aren't we? We're focused people. We want to know what's going on. We want to know... Uh, what the future might bring but we tend to be a bit narrow perhaps in our thinking so we went outside our industry as well and spoke to um, population experts social media experts gaming technologists economists you name it we had a, a chat with all of them and I was chatting with people around the world sometimes they would be in America so I'm in my pajamas because it's daytime there but I'm supposed to be asleep but nevertheless it's important to get the views from outside our industry so when we did that and we looked at it in what the meetings industry think the future will be it was economics and technology those were the things the big things that were going to happen in the future nevertheless when we went outside our industry it was a different thing they said people people will make decisions of whether they come or they won't come economics was obviously still important because there's been a world uh, economic uh, blip, yeah, <laughs> really, a, I guess. A, a uh, but it affected us a lot. Now, it didn't affect every single country in the world. However, because we're dealing with multinational companies, then obviously everybody was affected in some way or another because of the economic crisis that was occurring. However, <clears throat> there was a lot more to it than that. Businesses in the future will have to think about keeping people safe and secure because if people are afraid to step out of their own environment, their own country, then that's not good for us in our businesses. And there's political instability, there's massive climate changes going on, there's social changes, there's cultural changes. And when you have all of these changes, there's changes, there's changes, it's actually already been known, even though we're only in 2014, that this decade is the turbulent teens because the turbulence everywhere in terms of geopolitics social changes etc etc yeah. so these are the things that we've been discussing and investigating the, tur the turbulent teens the turbulent teens okay yeah 
That's a great little um, uh, soundbite for all of those people on social media. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, brilliant. They love that kind of thing, yes. Yeah, and one of the things that which we have actually found also is because of all of this turbulence, there's somebody like my mother. <laughs> you imagine my mother. She thinks, Alex, where are you going? Are you going on your own? <laughs> she could be watching right now. She could be that. watching. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, are you going on your own? How are you going to get from the airport to the hotel? Who's going to look after you when you're there? Who's going to take you from the hotel then to the convention center? Don't spend anything online. Don't use your visa card because somebody will steal your mm. identity. Yep. And do you know where the British Embassy is in case you get lost? These are the questions my mum asks me all the time. But what she actually is, is my conscience. Because everybody may be thinking like this. Some people are more risk takers than others. Some people are very cautious. And these were the things that we were finding in our research, that there's this extreme but as business people in the events industry, we have to make sure that people will feel safe, they will know where to go, they will already be registered with their embassy because we know where everybody's coming from, so we should have some risk assessment documents with the embassies ready in case you know, this person gets lost, gets, you know, can't find something, loses their passport, mm. anything like that. Just gentle things like that are important. All about the people. Yeah, so these are the things. The people will come or they won't come, depending if they feel safe. Okay, so we, we have issues on price. Okay. And then we have issues on, on people. So, yes. yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's becoming even trickier for, yeah. for people in the events world. Absolutely. And one of the other things that is probably important is like what we're doing right now. Many people are going to live in urban cities. It's called the borderless countries now because we don't just stay within our own country, we don't just stay in our own cities. There will be a generation in the future that will never have a desk permanent in an office of their own. There'll be a generation of hot deskers or home workers because there'll be organizations where 80% of their workforce could well be sat at home and working from their computers in that way. I'm lucky, I get a couple of days a week, often working at home if I'm doing a big research project and I need that space and quiet sometimes because as yeah. I, how much I love my colleagues and my <laughs> friends um, I do not want them necessarily sort of just yeah. saying Alex Alex can you just do uh, so it's really good to take that moment aside but that's not just me there are other people that work permanently at home so what do we do with a virtual meetings such as this to engage with an organization that's a multinational organization that has 80% of their workforce in different mm. places and obviously the first question, which was something that where Paul and I were talking about this morning, is what do we do with the time zone situation? <laughs> yeah, the time zone's been a the bit of a challenge <laughs> for this. <laughs> it does. Yeah. It has. And uh, we, my husband and I were watching a film just the other day, and it was, um, I can't remember the name of the film, because we chatted so much about this one particular issue, which was Zulu time. When you're in a submarine, which was what the film was about, um, you have to have a Zulu time. And the Zulu time is the same time and it just tracks no matter where you are. So you never go through a time zone in a submarine, which you might do a lot when you're yeah. traveling for several months and so on. So there's got to be something about how do we decide what time we are going to meet, what is useful for everybody, how can everybody be engaged and how do we tell them about this. Just the other day also, it sounds as though we watch TV a lot, actually. But, <laughs> <laughs> no, <you're> but, <laughs> but maybe we just noticed In Information the, gatherings, yeah. The, um, it was, the football was on. So there was, it was, um, oh, no, I can't remember now. Which, it was <laughs> Manchester United versus somebody. Yeah. Please forgive me, all Manchester United fans around the world. <laughs> but they, they, they had a great score in the end. You know, it was 3-0, three three so they did really, really well. But the thing was, we were watching, sorry? West Ham, thank West, you very much. West Ham, yeah. Manchester United, yeah. right. So, but whilst we were watching it, because we wanted to see when it was on the TV, and so we were trying to work out, well, it's four hours in England, yeah. and now it's, you know, this. However, on the television screen, it said Abu Dhabi time, it's on at this time, GMT, this one. And so we thought then, that should happen more often, because it's really useful for us in meetings and events mm. that 
if we're going to do virtual meetings like this, then we couldn't possibly do that if we were a multinational company and we've got satellite offices in 10 countries around the world because your screen would be like this and yeah. it would go on forever. But nevertheless, there perhaps ought to be some sort of like standard time mm. in the future that we could all work with because that does cause a little bit of chaos. So I, I quite fancy the Zulu time. <laughs> oh, I, I think uh, hearing about that, that would have been perfect for this event because yesterday we moved, uh, our first speaker was in New Zealand so we had Josh from New Zealand first thing in the morning, which for him was uh, the end of his Monday. Mm -hmm. And then we switched. Uh, we switched across to Vancouver and we had uh, a difference of uh, 11 hours behind. Well, there was 20 hour time difference and we were in the middle here in Abu Dhabi. So we, when I was discussing this with Martin, what did we put on the, on the viewing page yeah. for people looking at the event, when to join? And we, we came to the conclusion that we could only, well, we decided, I decided to put down just Abu Dhabi time, get everybody to come to that. Mm -hmm. Because if I put up three or four others, mm -hmm. states, Europe, UK, where do you end? Like you were saying, you'd be all across that page. Yes. So I'd love Zulu time and make these events a lot easier. Yes, well, we'd know where we were, <laughs> where we're working working to. The other interesting thing also that were coming, came out from our research was about cultural differences and naturally that's always a big yeah. issue and we know how effective on our industry the BRIC countries such as the Brazil, Russia mm -hmm. uh, and China and how important those countries have been on our businesses because it's exciting that new people are coming to our events but it's also exciting there's new opportunities for destinations elsewhere. Now the next generation of um, the superpowers are going to be you know, Mexico, Indonesia, Nigeria, Turkey. Those are the next superpowers. And the reason why they're going to be the next superpowers is they have a fantastic internal demographics because there are more people, they've, mm. they've got lots of people in their country already, but there's more people being born yeah. in that country and there's therefore more people working than not working, yeah. unlike some of the Western countries where because of the low fertility and the low mortality rates, then we have more people not working than yeah. working. So therefore, these are going to be the superpowers of the future because they will have a higher GDP in the future. And it's not going to be that long. So I, we I have was to just going to ask, how, how long are you looking for? Uh, I think that spelled mint. Did that spell yes, mint? Was mint, that right? Mint's so we're, we're moving from <laughs> brick to mint. Yeah. But what, when, we say, when you say in the future they're going to yeah. be coming through, what, what is that, 10 years' time, 20 years' time? Well, normally the statistics t tend to look towards 2050 on the United Nations uh, statistics. In terms of over the last 50 years, the um, over well, the older population has grown tripled yeah. three times. And in the next 50 years, it's going to triple again. So that means by 2050, there will be more over 60s in the world than there are under 16s. And that has a big influence on yeah. the world's population because generations want different things. They certainly have different needs here in our industry, for definite. Uh, but they have different ways of communicating. They have different ways of, uh, mm. well, just, just different needs here at events and elsewhere. So we have to kind of think about the older population a lot more because once you get to the age of 50, apparently. <laughs> when, right? when you get to 50. Yeah, you when you get that? to 50, <laughs> when you get to 50, then your spend opportunities goes up exponentially yeah. in comparison with where it has been because there's yeah. changes in uh, your family commitments, there's changes in your financial commitments and your sort of hopefully your employment is really good and it's a really good peak and so all of those things so your actual yeah value to businesses it goes up exponentially and so that's that's yeah. that's great yeah so it's all going to happen over the next 50 years <laughs> by, really? by well, no by 2050 by 2050, by 2050 so yeah. uh, this enormous 30, change 36 years yeah, time so it's not long it's yeah. not long i mean it's quite it can be quite tricky can't it for event planners to to be able to deal with uh, different cultures uh, in the audience uh, and, and how that might affect their ability to, to become engaged in certain yeah. activities. But also all those, those different age ranges now, if we've got about four different generations yes. all in the same place, then how do we cope with that as well? Yeah. I mean, any ideas from the audience? Any uh, experiences of... Mm -hmm. of any kind of, you know, do we, do we yeah. just target specifically 
do we find events are going to be just nailed down to this is a certain age range, this is a certain culture, or do you think that we are going to get more and more widespread in terms of mixing everybody together across and those will become normal events? Yeah. Or? Well, by 2050, based on the, the numbering, if you're keeping up with the numbering situation, there will be five generations in one room. So therefore, we've got the baby boomers, we've got Generation X, Generation Y, Millennials, and it won't be long before we have the next whatever we call them, <laughs> yeah. uh, whether they are Generation X or Zs rather, or whether they're going to be called, I want to call them Thummers, because they're so busy. Thummers. Thummers, the right, thumbing okay. generation, because right. we're also busy on our, uh, on our phones in that way, but we'll yeah. see what happens. So you, if you've got five generations in one room, you have to satisfy the needs of all of those generations. Mm. And that can be quite difficult. The Generation Y are called what's in it for me generation. And they have needs at conferences yeah. like ours here today. And they want concise content that's specific and personalized to them. Yeah. They look at their phone every nine minutes, yeah. not whilst they're sleeping, but I'll bet you they do look if they happen to wake up in the middle of the night and want to drink every water, nine minutes. they will be yeah. looking. And so these are the things that they are interested in. They want some personal engagement, but not quite as much as uh, the older generations, the Generation X which are a little bit more interested in co-creation with experts. This is what our research has, has found. Right. Getting involved, they have, they've got that need for, you know, to look somebody in the eye and, uh, and feel comfortable with that. And one of the things that you mentioned earlier, Paul, was about having people remotely. Yeah. And the words that we kind of hear are, to go forward, you have to think back. Once upon a time, when somebody phoned you, and you were at a social engagement, like a, at a restaurant, or you were maybe just having a coffee with somebody, mm. you would step away from the table and answer the phone, <laughs> okay? And you would, sorry, I just need to get the phone, yeah. and you go away. It's not like that now. It's all about people will join the conversation in which you're in from afar. So they join yeah. the conversation. They're not remote anymore. They just join the conversation. So they're either sending you a photograph, sending you a text, and you all share this as yeah. well and if you have a phone call they just join that you put them on loudspeaker and everybody's involved so i kind of wonder that they will ever be remote people yeah. there will always be people that are joining the conversation yes yeah yeah yes Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So for the for the benefit of the um, the online folk, because we didn't have a, a mic for Megan, she was just saying, <laughs> <laughs> uh, she was just saying that uh, social media has had a huge impact on the way that events are conducted, marketed, what's going on in events, and we were, you know, uh, uh, Megan was basically making the point that we've got people in the audience right now that are tweeting away and doing things and I know they're tweeting because I can see it I can see it on the iPad up here but interesting to your point of um, yeah, the engage the, the people want content specifically for them there are speakers I know that get really upset if um, if anybody is doing what you guys are doing they want you to be absolutely focused on the task of learning whatever the information is the older generation. Well, maybe some of the oldest. I can't say that though, because some speakers are really like Alan Stevens. Yesterday, he's great. He, he does all of this stuff. He tweets out. But it's interesting when you have speakers that are believing that just because people are on their devices, they're not taking anything on board. I think that's another kind of thing to come over. Because yeah. if you took the devices away and you said, right, there's a notebook and there's a pencil. Yeah. Uh, and you, we wouldn't mind, the speaker probably wouldn't mind them scribbling, but they might be doing their shopping list. So it's interesting how a device becomes almost like an obstacle and also like a, a great change thing. But uh, in our minds, we're not quite there, are we? No. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's ridiculous as well if you think about this life is on the mobile 
And when you really think about this, we talk about big data and how important big data is to us. The big data comes from your phone. So if you imagine your phone is having deep conversations with a multiple of computers somewhere, because there's somebody in the back office doing the analytics and checking what's being said. So these phones here and yours at home are having deep conversations with a computer all over the world. And because of these deep conversations, yeah. people, these computers know who you are, they know how old you are, they know if you're male or female, they know whether you, where your friends are, they know you're here, but they know where you live, they know what music you like, they know how you feel, because you say so, in your tweets and, and other things. So they'll be <laughs> looking at all of these things. Yeah. So your phone knows a lot more about you than your friends do. Because your friends know you as a friend, your business colleagues know you as a business person, and maybe the two do not swap mm. quite so much. But your mobile phone tells these computers, wherever they are in the world, <laughs> deep conversations and they know an awful lot about you. And it's important as event planners to embrace this and, and, and hire people that do the analytics. And a really lovely example is KLM. KLM had a follower on Twitter yeah. The lady was yeah. a runner, so she'd be saying, I'm going out running, I'm doing my running, I'm doing my running, and I'm whatever. And then they realized, because of her social engagement online, that she was going to Rome on KLM. And she was going to run in Rome and run around the city. So they have what's called a surprise campaign. So KLM somewhere have got the deep data about this one person. They know she runs, they know she's going to Rome, they know that she's on the plane, they know what plane she's on that sounds and scary so, to me mm. it sounds very scary so they presented her with a wristband to monitor I, you're running i don't know it runs so i don't know what it monitors but i'm sure it's something to do with heart rate and calories or something along those lines and she was presented that just because of her social media activity yeah. can we do that in the events industry should we do that will people share that much with us they do already but some people are, are a little afraid about the security of data. Remember my mother, my social conscience, if you do things online, yeah. somebody's going to steal your identity. So I guess as meeting plans, we have to think of the both sides of things. We want their data, so if we can give them something in return for that, mm. they would like it because that's your first answer here, isn't it? More for less. Yeah. And yeah, similarly, yeah. we need to also ensure that there's some little security emblems somewhere, the little mm. padlock somewhere, all of those kinds of things that people will know they're not sharing the data with everybody. Well, you were saying as well in our, in our uh, preview conversation about um, KLM and how they're doing this kind of is it meet and seat where yeah. you can kind of choose where you want to sit on a, on a flight, uh, yeah. depending on the preferences of other people through their social media, yeah. which to me again, sounds a little bit too scary. Sometimes I just want to sit on a flight and do nothing. I just want to sit there and, and not engage with anybody. So, But if Mr. Google was yeah. on that plane, yeah. I'd want to sit next to him for definite. <laughs> if I could find that was him, I would sit there. If David Beck was on the plane, I'm sitting next to him. <laughs> he's driving up. Yeah, he's probably, yeah. <laughs> you know, these he's got are his the own people. plane. So if you were on a 12-hour flight and you wanted someone to talk to, yeah. Mr. Google's interesting. David Beckham's very interesting. Yeah. And, you know, selfies, for yeah. sure. Yeah. What do you... <laughs> The piece about um, uh, mobile and, and all that thing and, and how you construct events, to what extent are you then mindful during a presentation you've got to allow for that? Because you know, if, if everything that you're saying can be distilled down into a 140 character tweet that is then shared, you know, to what extent is a half an hour presentation being, sort of the context is being lost? And on the second part, the second part of that is, what, what actually about social media is, what it has actually fueled is it's a total and utter egocentricity of the tweeter. So your presentation today isn't about you, it's about how that has then been translated by the journalist in the room or the, the delegate in the room who's then tweeting out to their followers. It's yeah. almost as if they're now the, the messenger, not you. Yeah. So there's this kind of this, this weird, um, uh, if I'm tweeting out this, this particular presentation, I'm telling my followers of some kind of like, oh, well, this has just happened. So it's no longer about you, you're now... This is, the message has now been sort of handed over to somebody else yes. to broadcast. Yes. So I was just wondering about how that then changes, A, how you present, mm. the way you present, the length of your presentation, natural gaps, any, anything like that. Is that something that we really have to take into consideration? 
Yeah. We also have another. Of course. Yeah. I, I actually, I disagree with that. Um, the, only, the only reason is, is that I think that if your content is interesting enough that they want to share it. I agree that some people could say, hey, look what I'm sending you. But I think it's more about, wow, you had such a great presentation. I've got these nuggets. Like personally, I do find things like very interesting and I want to share it with people and say, wow, you really should know about this. This is really hot. Like now, get online, tune in. There's some really great conversations going on. So I would look at it from that respect. But it'd be interesting to see what you have to say. <laughs> Now, aren't we? Okay, you go. You guys, <laughs> yes. you guys, you guys can leave. We'll carry on. <laughs> but isn't isn't that the best thing? What you have just done a live yeah, version yeah, of what's happening on Twitter, yeah. what's happening on oh, Facebook, of course, and what happens just generally. And it's about spreading the word, word of mouth. And you're having a live conversation with each other, but that could also be happening on Twitter, Facebook. It happens on Facebook loads of times when you're talking about some exciting mm. event to do. I think, in a way, there is the notions about, especially with the younger generation, with the generation um, millennials and the generation Y, they do have a, uh, it seems from the research, they seem to have the ability to be able to be on three or four platforms at once and still be engaged. And I know as a lecturer as well, I kind of have no frustration with people engaging with their computers and their laptops up. Because if they, again, find something interesting, take something away, there's always been a lot of research. If you listen for an hour, you will only probably remember 5 to 10% of what's been said. So if somebody tweets something, then because of your way you learn, you learn by listening, writing, doing. These are the hmm. ways that you learn about things. So if they listen, write something, and read it afterwards, then they've actually learnt three times and that's probably better than just the old-fashioned way of listening. Sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, is there any research in terms of like attention deficit? Because they are on multiple platforms. Mm -hmm. It is a split second here and there. In terms of the deep learning and understanding, yeah. is that going to be a decline? And I. I appreciate what you were saying is like do you actually then do here's your key little nuggets for yeah. it and that's what they're interested in or do you carry on and get like what, what is the research on that in terms of the understanding of the deeper level of what they're actually getting out of it I wish I had a 90% maybe that could be another question so that's another question yeah. for sure as a, per, as a as a lecturer over the years I haven't found any decline in the level of student engagement and the work that they produce. I actually think it's a little bit harder because when I do research, I probably spend about a day and a half getting journal articles, getting books, looking at chapters, reading things because there is so much out there. So I think yeah. it, it's less difficult to be a surface learner now because there's so much there. So you probably read more, perhaps not as deeply, but you know, so by the time you've read 20 things about the same thing, it's in there, and I, I, so I haven't, I haven't seen a decline for sure in the attention. No. I know that's an anecdote. <laughs> oh yes, <laughs> oh yes, graduates. Sorry, yeah, the, the, sorry. The question was like, you yeah. know, with, with social media and with with instant, in, you know, with instant response to anything you're saying and with access to, you know, the internet and all of its, you know, infinitesimal amount of resource. Yes. Are you finding now that, that, you know, you're a lecturer at university, mm -hmm. um, uh, whether students or at people at events like this, are much more ready to challenge what you're saying and are much more confident in challenging and have a much more of a ready well of information yes. with which to challenge you. So, mm -hmm. in a sense, the lecturer has moved from being I'm, you know, I'm telling you what yeah. you need to know to I'm the starting point of a conversation. Yeah, I, I like the idea of calling it the starting point of a conversation. I think that's a lovely expression. I will definitely use that. I will tweet that later for sure. Um, what we cannot do is, which we did to begin with, when there's lots more out there, social media, YouTube videos, 
even uh, lectures from other organisations, TED Talks, anything like that, there's no way you can include that within your lectures because that's free. Students pay a lot of money to come to our universities. Mm. So if you start bringing in a lot of free stuff, they get annoyed about that because they can see that in their own time. So yes, direct them to those things, but we have to do a different kind of job than we used to do, I think, because of that. And I'm yeah. not saying it's harder for us because it's more enjoyable because we all like to yeah. learn something new every day, but you can't just point, uh, use yeah. free yeah. stuff because why ever would a student pay yeah. high fees if all you're giving them is free stuff from somewhere else and not my engagement? Yeah. No, it's brilliant. Yeah. I think the questions, I mean, it's great. We wanted questions. We asked for those at the start of the session and at the start of yesterday as well because this is all about stimulating debate. So. How do people get hold of you? Because I'm sure there's, there's more questions to come and from so. you guys as well. Uh, what's the best way to get hold of you and ask those questions? And my second question after that mm -hmm. is uh, your offer. You had a, an offer that you want to promote. So, uh, and then we're going to need to close because Tim Chapman will be coming on next. And he's, yeah. uh, do stay with us, of course, because he's talking about the future of hybrid events and right. what he sees coming around the corner. And it's exactly the kind of thing that we can... Uh, yeah. keep that future theme rolling this morning so best okay. way of keeping uh, questions contact with you what would that well, be qu um, I'm on Twitter so it would be Alex J Kenyon I'm also email which I I still hold on to I hold on to all my gadgets <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a video recorder anymore but we, <laughs> we, we do have quite we a have lot videos, of other yeah. tech at home uh, but I'm also a dot Kenyon at leadsmet.ac.uk so that's my business email so I'd be delighted to uh, engage in any way in that way yeah. with you and the research that I have been telling you about today came as I said at the beginning through MPI and so I have a I, I, we will have to send it out perhaps to those people that are engaged here yeah. because there's a special code. No, they're very engaged. This audience yeah. is brilliantly yeah. engaged. So, it's, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think so they you would go well. up to the um, website with <laughs> MPI and I would give you a code, then you can download the Future of Meetings white paper that we have done. But also we would like you to join um, MPI's LinkedIn conversation Future of Meetings because we're quite busy on there yeah. as well. Yeah, no, that's great. And if uh, the, the online folks uh, yeah, want to, to follow that through with you, they can do exactly the same, yes, contact please. you and say, look, really enjoyed the session. Of course they would. But, and um, <laughs> I'm, I'm basically just... Uh, uh, yeah. then get those details from you so that is yeah. brilliant okay well lots of food for thought i think yeah, I hope so. Uh, so that's been really cool and um yeah on behalf of event camp middle east 2014 i'd like to thank you dr alexandra kenyon thank you for being with us today live from gibtm mm -hmm. in abu dhabi national exhibition center in the middle of the trade show trying out some new ideas coming forwards from with some different uh discussion uh, and really thinking about the future of the events industry and how we can all play a role to, to improve that for the success of business and organizations everywhere. So thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure. <laughs>